Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ed James. I'm from Southampton. Um, and to be honest, I feel a little bit of a fraud being here at a Birdshot meeting when actually I'm not really going to talk about Birdshot. But what I hope to give you is a flavor of the work that we're currently doing in the lab in Southampton, looking at another disease um, called ankylosing spondylitis, which although isn't, doesn't seem on the, out, on the outside to be very, very similar to birdshot. There, really, there are a number of people, up to 20 to 30 percent of people with ankylosing spondylitis, spondylitis that have anterior uveitis as part of their symptoms. And so what I want to do is give you an idea of what we're currently doing in ankylosing spondylitis and then to say how we, myself and my lab, would like to get involved in research on birdshot retinopathy um, to try and understand maybe more of the mechanisms of why it occurs, how it occurs, and then also, if we can understand that, based on my favorite protein that I'll come to in a minute, we then might be able to develop new therapies or different approaches to therapies that ultimately will lead to less toxicology and much more specific treatments. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. So my favorite protein is called ERAP1. Um, and Jonas has quite kindly already alluded to this pathway in his, in his um, talk. But ERAP1 plays a fundamental role in this antigen processing pathway whereby you start off with an intact protein, gets chopped up into much, much smaller fragments called peptides. And these peptides are then loaded onto your MXC class 1 molecule or HLA molecule which are then presented at the cell surface for recognition by your soldier cells, your killer T cells, your CD8 T cells. And your CD8 T cells require these peptides to be presented to know what is right and what is wrong. So in a normal situation, it's going, these cells are going around the body looking for anything that's different. And most times there'll be nothing different, so it looks at it and it'll just move away. But if this cell is infected with a virus, this protein will have been derived from the virus and once you get the viral peptides out to the cell surface, those T cells can recognize that as foreign. And when it recognizes it as foreign, they become activated. And by being activated, they can then kill the cell and ultimately killing the virus and clearing the virus from the body. Now, ERAP1, here is called ERAP1 and ERAP2. It actually does look like Pac-Man. I know I've put it there as a Pac-Man shape, but if the only thing you take away from my talk is that ERAP1 is Pac-Man, I can go away happy. That's all I want you to know. ERAP1 is Pac-Man. And what it does is, what we know now is that the vast majority of these small peptides that get in to be loaded onto your class 1 molecule are too long. So your MHC, your HLA molecules, require peptides, these small fragments of proteins, to be of a very particular size. And most of the ones that get into this area to be loaded are a little bit too long. And this is where ERAP comes in. So it goes along, takes these longer peptides, just chops away and chomps away one amino acid at a time until it gets it down to the correct size. And once it gets to the correct size, it can then get out to the surface. Now, over the last sort of six or seven years, ERAP1 has come into prominence in a whole host of different diseases. So as Jonas was talking about those whole genome studies where we're looking at differences, genetic variation between people with a disease versus healthy controls, has identified particular genetic variants called polymorphisms within ERAP1 associated with a whole host of different cancers, particularly those cancers that are virally induced, so human papilloma cancers. And also, as you can see here, a huge number of autoimmune diseases. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the majority of those autoimmune diseases that have been identified as being linked or at least associated with ERAP1 are ones that have a huge um, association with particular HLA molecules. At the moment, I put this as a question mark for birdshot, only because from Jonas's work, he's identified ERAP2. But being an eternal optimist, I believe ERAP1 has to be involved somewhere. So it may just be a matter of time before we identify ERAP1 being involved. Um, and then another completely unrelated condition, or what we believe to be an unrelated condition, ERAP1 is also involved in hypertension. And so four years ago or so, ERAP1, I said it was a Pac-Man, and thankfully, when scientists actually looked to see what the molecular structure of ERAP1, it did actually turn out to be Pac-Man. Now, this is the structure of what it looks like. Hopefully, if you sort of look at it and tilt your head a little bit and sort of close one eye, maybe, it does look a little bit like Pac-Man. <laughs> but essentially, what we know is that it exists in two forms. It has an open form, which allows these peptide fragments to get in and bind, and then a closed form, whereby it starts to chop it. 
So what happens is that these two areas of the molecule, these domains stay stable, and these two start to move around, getting that sort of Pac-Man, sort of crocodile mouth um, action, which is why I'd be probably in my head, Pac-Man is the main um, image that I have. But on the left-hand side here, these are the five main polymorphic genetic variants that have come up in all these different studies looking at how ERAP1 may be linked with different diseases. And because it's a birdshot community, and I couldn't leave any stone unturned, I've actually did a little animation for you, which I can show you where they are in the protein. See that? Magic. So what we know is that these polymorphisms, these changes, are arranged all around the molecule. But the problem is that because they're all around the molecule, it makes it really difficult for us to understand what they are doing to that protein. What are they doing to it? Um, and as you can see here, in the middle of the protein is where it actually does the trimming, where it does the trimming of the peptides. But none of these mutations are actually anywhere near that. But what we do know, and I'm not going to go into it because it's very much scientific and it's probably not for this audience, but what we do know is that all these polymorphisms change the ability for ERAP to do the job of trimming those peptides down to the correct size. And most of the time, what it does is it reduces the efficiency to do that. And so to come on to the reason why I'm here, to talk about ankylosing spondylitis. So it has many parallels to a certain extent with birdshot in that it is a chronic auto-inflammatory condition. However, it mostly affects the spine, in particular sacroiliac joints. And this leads, lends itself, leads it from a normal spine to get local inflammation at these joints, which causes bone degradation and then re-establishment of bone, which ultimately, if untreated, and most of the time in people that are treated, leads to fusion of the vertebra. And that gives the classic sort of hunch posture that you see in a lot of people with ankylosing spondylitis later on in their disease. But very similarly to birdshot, it has a really, really strong association with an HLA molecule. So with birdshot, it's HLA A29. But in ankylosing spondylitis, it's HLA B57. Now, this association has been known for over 40 years now. However, even within those 40 years, we still have no real idea of why HLA-B27 is associated with the disease. But we do know that it is such a strong association that greater than 95% of people who have the disease will have HLA-B27, and very similarly to HLA-A29 and birdshot. But as Jonas was talking about earlier, about 10%, eight, between 8 and 10% of people in the population have HLA-B27, but only 2 to 3% of those people will get the disease. So it's obviously not HLA-B27 that's the causative factor. There must be other elements that are involved. And this is where I believe ERAP1 will probably play one of the major roles in why people will then go on to get the disease. Um, so to put our study into, into what we see here, so to just have a look to see what ERAP, the role ERAP might be playing, the disease, playing in the disease. We took patients um, with ankylosing spondylitis and also healthy controls and looked at the ERAP1 molecules that they had within their body, the different ERAP1 molecules, and then looked at them to see how they compared with those with disease and those without disease. And what we found was that when we looked at the whole ERAP molecule, we found there were many, many different varieties, many different versions that had different polymorphisms and maybe had the same polymorphisms, but in different orders. And what that meant that overall, we had 13 different variants, 13 what we call allotypes within the population, which means it is highly polymorphic. It's not one of these monomorphic proteins that just maybe have a spontaneous mutation in the wrong place at the wrong time. These are very polymorphic within the general population. But when you look at the numbers that we get here, for those of you who are a little bit can actually see so far, when we looked at the differences between people with disease and without disease, we saw some trends, but it wasn't really jumping out at us. So that obviously in controls, people who had this uh, number two version seemed to have, was the most common version, but in people with disease, we, we rarely saw it. Whereas others such as O1 and O5 were much more prevalent in those people with disease. But this obviously isn't huge numbers and it doesn't really strike out to be able to say these people definitely have disease and these people don't. And so we then thought, hold on a minute, maybe we're approaching this a little, a little bit too simplistically. So rather than just looking at all the ERAPs that everybody that has disease have and all the ERAPs that people who don't have disease have, why don't we go back to the individual patients? Now, this is where we go into a little bit of genetics, but it's very simple, so don't worry about it. So 
when we look at our genes, we inherit our genes from our parents. We get one copy from our mum and one copy from our dad. And when we've been looking at all that information, we've just been putting them all together. But obviously, for each gene that encodes ERAP, we get one Pac-Man. But in our body, we'll have two copies of that because we'll have one from our mum and one from our dad. That means then that potentially each one of us will have two different versions of ERAP going around our body, going with that in, around our cells. So the problem is, what does that mean? So rather than treating them as a whole population, let's start going back into individual patients and saying, which two ERAP molecules do you have as a person with disease versus what two molecules do you have as somebody who doesn't have disease? And when we did that, we found something quite striking in that when we looked at the different combinations that people had who had no disease, we saw no combinations that were in controls that were ever seen in patients. And combinations that we saw in patients that had the disease, we never saw them in people who didn't have disease. Now, this was quite astounding from the fact that we're now able, potentially, to identify those people with disease compared to those people without disease. So there are similar corollaries with people with ankylosing sp spondylitis in that the, the general symptoms is back pain. Now, most people throughout their life will have an episode of back pain. And so for these patients, it can take up to 10 years to be definitively diagnosed with the condition. And so at the moment, there's no current specific test for ankylosing spondylitis. Most of it is done by a process of elimination of other diseases and also the reliance on identifying damage to the spine by either an MRI or a t CT scan to definitively say you definitely have disease. So what we hope to have achieved here and what we're planning to do and what we're currently developing is maybe a specific diagnostic test for those people with the disease so that when they turn up at a back pain, pain clinic and also have sort of screening for the HLA B27, we can say definitively very, very early on, you have ankylosing spondylitis and you do not have the other back pain um, diseases. So that, from a, a medical side of things, is, is pretty good. But as a scientist, I don't want to settle for being able to identify the people with disease. I want to understand why these people have disease. Why do these people get the disease, and why do other people not get disease? And so what we wanted to do is, obviously, we have these combinations that completely separate people with disease versus people that don't have disease. So we want to say, what effect do these different versions of ERAP have on the overall ability for those Pac-Men to make the correct peptides to get onto the MHC molecules, the HLA molecules? And so rather than show you all the results for all the 15 different combinations, I've picked three out for you. I picked the most common um, pair that we have for controls, the most common pair for people with disease, and then just because I'm very generous, I've added an extra one in for you. And so to make you all sort of citizen scientists, this is the assay that we do to assess how well those Pac-Men are working. So what we do is we take cells that have no ERAP. And what that allows us to do is then put different ERAPs in, regardless of whichever ones they are, to make up the combination that we find in those individuals, whether they're people who have disease or those that don't have disease. What we also then use is a model peptide that will be presented to T cells at the surface. And this is made in a form that has an extension of five amino acids that requires the action of ERAP, the chopping up, to remove these five amino acids to release this peptide. And only if the ERAP is able to trim these peptides will this then get to the cell surface where these lovely yellow T cells are not yellow in real life. Um, these yellow T cells will be able to recognize and become activated and stimulated. And that's what we detect. And so again, I'll take you through these graphs because I, I appreciate that most people probably aren't used to seeing these things. What we have up on the y-axis here is the amount of stimulation that was given to that T cell, i.e. the higher it is, the better the action is of the ERAP molecules that were present. So if they worked really, really well, you'll get a lot of stimulation, therefore it'll be much higher. And across the x-axis is just a titration of number of cells. The idea is the less you have, the lesser effect you see. So if we take the combination that we saw in controls, we see we have one molecule of ERAP present in that individual that works really, really well, stimulating the T cell really well. You have another version that doesn't really work very well at all. It's sort of maybe 80% reduction in its ability to do the job that it's supposed to do. 
But when you put them together in these triangles here, you see that you rescue the phenotypes. So overall, they trim really well. Even though you have one good one and one bad one, the good one is able to compensate for the bad one. When you take this version in the case where you have these two molecules here, again, they have an ERAP that works really, really well, this number two. They also have an ERAP that doesn't work very well, number six. But in this version, when you put them together, you don't see that rescuing. So what we're seeing here is that this number six is dominating the response. So even though it can't trim very well, we don't believe it can trim very well, it's actually preventing this ERAP from working. And then in the most common one for people with disease, we have two ERAPs don't work very well. So unsurprisingly, you put them together, they still don't work very well. And so when we plug all that into what we see in patients and controls, what we see is that the combinations of ERAPs in people without disease will have they can have bad ERAPs, they can have ERAPs that don't work very well, but they're always in combination with ERAPs that do work really, really well. So they're able to rescue that phenomenon, rescue that trimming. Whereas those people that, don't, that have disease will either have two defective ERAPs, or if they have a really good ERAP, it's always put in with one of those ERAPs that seems to dominate the response, even though it can't trim very well. And so that then obviously has implications for maybe how we believe the disease is occurring. So what I've showed you to date, people has all been done in a mouse system, in an animal model, whereby it doesn't really necessarily say this, give the same conclusions as you would maybe expect in a human. So to try and make it more physiological, we then adopted a system where we were looking at HLA-B27 because it's so prominent. And what we were asking here is how well do those ERAPs make peptides to, to be presented on the surface in B27? Because one of the main hypotheses for why people get disease based on the B27 is because the B27 is not a normal HLA molecule. Rather than being in its normal happy state on the surface presenting to T cells saying this is something foreign, kill the cell, it will start to change and change its shape and have an altered form that in itself is immunogenic regardless of what the peptide is that it's presenting. And so what we believe is that patients have an increased number of those versions compared to the good versions. They have a lot of the bad versions. And the bad versions are caused because you do not have enough of the good peptides, the ones of the correct size, that allow the molecules to be stable. And so what that means is that if your ERAPs cannot generate these good peptides, you're then going to have a lot more of these poor, misfolded different versions on the cell surface that are going to be immunogenic. And so what we see in controls here is when we look at their ability to make peptides, they're really, really good. So increasing the number of these HLA molecules by 10 to 20%, showing that they are making really good peptides. And it's very unlikely that these, MHC, these HLA molecules are going to change their form into these abnormal forms and become immunogenic. Whereas when we look at those from patients, what we see is that there are some that can increase the number of peptides, but it's very, very low. And we even see in some instances a decrease in the levels, showing that the quality of peptides is really, really poor in terms of being able to stabilize those HLA molecules. And so we're currently now trying to understand what this will mean in terms of immune responses in those individuals and to try and then under identify exactly why it is that B27 is so prevalent in the population. And so we sort of built up a little chart here. So I like to call it the Goldilocks chart. And the Goldilocks is all based on how well ERAP works. So if you're, if you're a person who has good ERAP, porridge, you know, ERAP that is not too hot and not too cold, just right in the middle, you're going to be one of these what we call efficient trimmers. You're going to make lots and lots of good peptides, and you're not going to have a very, much, very high risk of getting AS. If, however, your porridge is too cold or your ERAPs don't work very well, you're going to be very inefficient at generating those peptides that stabilize, and you're, increase, you're going to have an increased risk. At the opposite end of the scale, if your ERAP is too hot, you're going to destroy all those peptides, and then ultimately you'll also increase your AS risk. And so I'm not going to go through the summary just because I think you pretty much understood, hopefully. <laughs> but then to try and relate that into birdshot, what would be really good in my point of view from the ERAP1 side of things is do the ERAP1 combinations allow you to identify patients with the condition? 
or at least identify people who are at the highest risk of getting the condition so that potentially we've heard today that some people are diagnosed very, very rapidly, but other people can take many years to be diagnosed. And would this then for, therefore form a test where diagnosis can be much more rapidly um, given? And then also then try to relate the function of the ERAT1 to the HLA-A29 molecule, because in AS, it's, as in AS, that why A29 is important in birdshot is not really understood. And then finally, obviously, there are some antigens, some peptides that may be more important or may be sort of the smoking gun of why people actually get the disease or why you start getting the disease. And therefore, we can understand how the different ERAPs that people may have may affect that generation, how it is presented, i.e., is it presented in a good way that you don't respond to, or is it in a bad way where you actually start to get an autoimmune response? And so I'd love to claim all the credit for all that work, but sadly, I can't. <laughs> so I've had a small team in Southampton. Um, the majority of the work that I've shown here is done by my postdoc, Emma Reeves. Um, and also, I have to thank all the clinical colleagues that have actually been able to get the samples, obviously the patients who've donated the samples, and obviously the people who have funded the work. Thanks very much. Thank you.